More of us are living in cities. Cities are changing faster than ever, as are the needs of people living in them. Ageing is the big demographic shift. You put that together with urbanisation, you're seeing the two big demographic shifts across the world. Urban populations, more people want to live in cities and grow old in cities. In 15 years time, at least a quarter of the world's population living in cities is going to be aged 60 and over. But are we ready for this change? Who is representing the older population? Who is actually making sure these people are happy? Who is making sure that they are part of the community? I'm not ready to sit back and just let other people make decisions for me where I live. I want to use the city, but it's not been designed with people like me in mind. Where do you want to live when you're older? In the past, many associated retirement with somewhere warm, often by the seaside. But increasingly, this isn't the case. As our older population grows, so too do the numbers of senior citizens wishing to remain in cities. We'll now find people who've lived in the same house, same community, 40, 50 years. And they don't necessarily want to move to the south coast when they reach a certain age. I've got three daughters in New Zealand who are desperate for us to go and live there. But I, I can't. I don't. This is my hometown. This is my country. These so-called old people have themselves spent their life building up the city, building up the NHS, building up other resources. So they have a right to a good old age. A great place to see this change in action is Manchester. However, adapting to this change is made more difficult by the entrenched inequalities that exist in the city. The experience of ageing is very unequal. For some people, ageing can create great opportunities. For other people, the experience of ageing is much more challenging. And in Manchester, that is very much related to the neighbourhood where you grow older. Manchester is one of the cities with the lowest uh, life expectancy in comparison to other cities. You have large levels of pension and poverty, social exclusion, high levels of crime, public services have been hit by government cuts. There are real challenges for us. However, while the challenges may be great, the city has historically made a strong commitment to dealing with them. In 2010, Manchester became the first city in the UK to become a member of the World Health Organization's global network of age-friendly cities, and to this day is leading the way in finding innovative strategies and approaches to the issue. It's one view that actually cities should be organised around the needs of young people and of working age people, and actually, for a large part, they are. How dare they say that old people are not wanted in the city? We helped to build the bloody city. Age-friendly cities are defined by the World Health Organization as supportive urban environments that encourage active ageing through a range of domains. As Lord Mayor, I have uh, issued the Lord Mayor's Challenge to organisations and to, uh, to, to individuals. Small incremental changes that help to make life better uh, around transport, uh, around housing, around access to employment, leisure. And that can be as simple as giving up your seats on the bus or the tram or as, as complicated as actually rearranging signage in public buildings. This is about making sure that older people feel that the city belongs to them as much as it belongs to everybody else. If you think about it, cities are great places for older people to live because the health services, the housing, the transport system is all on their doorstep. As well as championing an age-friendly approach, the city is also using some innovative measures to address the city's changing needs. Which is where Tina comes in. My name is Tina Buffel and I work in Manchester University on a project called uh, Developing Age-Friendly Cities. 
The project's aim is to gain a deeper understanding of the issues that older people themselves view as important in developing age-friendly neighbourhoods. 123 people participated in 14 focus groups, but what is really innovative was that the older people themselves then conducted 68 interviews with hard-to-reach older residents about their needs to age well in the community. We have trained 18 older co-researchers. These older co-researchers actually went out in their own community, in the neighbourhood where they are living, to recruit what we call the more difficult to reach older people. People who live in social isolation, people who live in poverty. The older co-researchers played a key role in all stages of the research, including the planning, the design, data collection and implementation phases. This is hardly new. You could argue we've had a whole history of community consultation since the 1960s, but most of the projects did not involve the different groups they were trying to reach out to. They had professionals who were often doing the, the job. The elderly people, you know, they could be very suspicious if you don't approach them in the right way. People don't trust uh, sometimes public services and other services. Somebody with a clipboard, Yes, no answers. Somebody who looks a bit authoritative, he's a professor, he's doing his PhD. Not willing to spend an hour with you listening, really listening. By recruiting older people as co-investigators, the research was able to gain a more detailed insight into the needs of older residents and get a clearer understanding of the way in which an age-friendly community might be developed. By going to them directly, I was really amazed, you know, by what I heard from some of them. I was really amazed. I couldn't stop them. I thought I knew a lot, but, you know, they, you know, they educated me a bit. It's not about wanting information from people because they're a certain age or a certain ethnicity or a certain gender. It's about valuing people for who they are. The gentleman kissed my hands and he said no one has ever asked him his opinions before. And that was, you know, that really touched me. It's fascinating what people tell you. And, and some of the people that, that we interviewed, we found were in dire distress and hadn't been able to tell anybody. As well as conducting the research, Tina is training her team of co-researchers to analyse or code the results of the qualitative field research. My name is Elaine. I'm retired, but I'm much more busier than I was when I worked. Today, well, we have been trained in, in co-researchers and today I've learned something, we are coding it. It's a kind of analysis of what was said. The older co-researchers are really involved in the data analysis and looking at the data that comes out of the research. It's looking at the paragraph, seeing what comes out to us and we put names of that paragraph, for example, loneliness or civic, or civic duties or things like that. It's very high powered. <laughs> it seems simple, but this kind of approach brings data to life and reveals key priority areas that can be targeted by local authorities. So what has it uncovered? Alexander Park is the second largest park in Manchester, but it has been neglected for years. The whole place is not friendly. People do not feel freely to go and visit it partly because of security, partly because, you know, it's not conducive to everybody with limited mobility, for example. The park has recently undergone an extensive redevelopment. Some of the co-researchers took part in the planning, putting age-friendly principles into the design, including more accessible paths and improved age-friendly seating, with armrests designed specifically for older people. If you go into that park now, everything was designed with everybody's age concept in mind. As well as the regeneration of public spaces like this, the scheme has identified the need for better local transport, as well as the importance of social meeting spaces within the neighbourhood. Welcome to Chulton Good Neighbours, a neighbourhood care group that has been providing social, practical and emotional support for older community members since 1967. What strikes me when you walk in here is Firstly is the sound, it's a very lively hubbub. I came when I lost my husband and it was the best thing that I ever did. 
being stuck in the house, in the flat, was terrible. When somebody said, come along to Good Neighbours at Chorlton, I thought, oh, all them old folk there. Real, you know. <laughs> anyway, I came. As well as providing support for the older community members, Chalton Good Neighbours aims to harness the potential of this community by encouraging them to support other community groups. They introduced me to be a voluntary service. I come on a Tuesday to toddlers. I help out voluntary to the toddlers. It's, you know, it's like another world really to me. I don't know, we couldn't do without Chalton Good Neighbours. The people that come here, Definitely. They love it. A lot of people would be very lonely, I think. It's his loneliness. It is. Some of them have nobody at all. When people are isolated like this, they can become hard to reach, which makes helping and supporting them extremely difficult. As a community worker, it's always been very difficult to get information out to people who live in this sprawling community that we live in. So um, the Age Friendly Project was thought of as a way of finding alternative ways of connecting with people. There's a growing amount of evidence that shows the connection between social relationships and good health. We already know that if people are more socially connected, if they're more active, if they take more exercise, if they have more friends, they have better relationships, they live longer. They'll have a healthier later life. And if you have a healthier later life, you're not making so much claims on resources. But Chalton Good Neighbours is only half the story. Tina's project is helping the older community to help themselves. Some of the co-researchers have really proved to become community activists around the age-friendly agenda. They said it was a priority to do work around loneliness and social isolation. So we were successful in bringing 10 million pounds to Greater Manchester to do work around loneliness and social isolation. So why isn't everyone doing this? The challenge is that it's quite time consuming. It involves really intense levels of contact with community organisations, with different groups of people, and it also involves a very um, rigorous uh, recruitment process. In these times of austerity, can we really commit this level of time and resources to gaining insight? We know that there's not going to be huge change in the resources available to our programme. And what we've been trying to do is think through what age-friendly communities means in a period of permanent austerity. What we need to try and do is really create a sustainable involvement of older uh, adults. If I would want to take this research project one step further is to work with older people not only as the co-researchers but also as the people who are training other older co-researchers. It's about a kind of model of training the trainers and then that's, that's one opportunity how you can um, multiply it. The continued success of this project relies heavily on innovative partnerships like the one seen here in Manchester, between the University of Manchester, the Manchester Institute for Collaborative Research on Ageing, Manchester City Council and community organisations. Innovative partnerships of people who work together is really the way forward. When you bring it down to its base level, what we're talking about here is equal opportunities. One of the dangers if we don't do anything is that the people who are already most excluded are going to be more and more socially excluded. They will become lethargic, they will disengage, they will become ill. We'd find that people are dying needlessly prematurely because they don't have the social relationships that keep them going. Manchester might be leading the way, but it's definitely something that is translatable to other contexts. It's happening in downtown Hong Kong and it's happening right across Europe. In 2010, there were 10 cities signed up to this agenda. There are now 250 cities and communities across the world. So there's something going on here. I'm not worried about the future at all because I know age-friendly exists.